All right, let's get started. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending this session. It's, uh, it's really an honor and a privilege to be here with you. Uh, people are hardwired to care about social and personality psychology. We want to understand ourselves, how we fit in the world, and why other people think, act, and behave the way they do. Uh, we want to know why prejudice and conflict persist, why some relationships flop and others flourish, and why two people react differently to the same event. Social and personality psychologists, what we do is we help to create that knowledge. We also spend most of our lives sharing it. But we've entered a new era of how we communicate our science and who receives the information. With the swipe of a finger or the click of a mouse, millions of people can learn about our science. Now our speakers today have, an, have helped lead a growing movement aimed at communicating our science to a general audience. Each year they are read by millions of people. I count Eli Finkel, Liz Don, Dave Myers, and John Tierney as both friends and sources of inspiration. And it is an honor and a privilege to share this stage with them. So without any further delay, please help me to welcome our first speaker, Eli Finkel. Thank you to uh, Nathan and Samin for organizing the conference, inviting uh, uh, me and the co-panelists to speak. Um, so there have been a couple interesting recent developments um, that inspired me to talk about this specific topic. One was a, a talk given by uh, Lee Jussum at, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot my topic, right? So the ethics of giving psychology away or, the psycho or psychology's contribution to the uh, marketplace of ideas. At CESP, and I just have learned maybe perhaps earlier today here, uh, Lee Jussum gave a talk that inspired me to do a lot of interesting thinking, or at least I think it's been interesting, and we've had some productive correspondence. Um, the talk was desperately seeking the wow effect and data interpretation and scientific storytelling as issues of research integrity. And, and Lee uh, raised, I think, some fairy, fairly valid concerns about the extent to which we as scientists are overclaiming about the robustness, the magnitude of our effects in, in various contexts, but with relevance to this symposium within the context of sharing our findings with the media. Now, it turns out that there is empirical support in various disciplines for this idea. This is a, a paper that's forthcoming in the British Medical Journal uh, entitled The Association Between Exaggeration and Health-Related Science News and Academic Press Releases, a Retrospective Observational Study. Now, what they did in this study is they looked at the extent to which there's exaggerations in the media and then went back and looked at the press releases and lo and behold, it's not just those terrible journalists, I'm looking at you, um, who tend to exaggerate. They often exaggerate because we told them to, because we described the work in an exaggerated manner. Problem. Now, let me switch gears. There is a second set of issues that has come to my attention recently. This in the pages of the New York Times. Many of you are probably fans of the Upshot column. Some of you might have read this. How economists came to dominate the conversation. This was from about a month ago. And it was, it, again, in the upshot column. So this is some evidence uh, about the frequency, the, the percentage of articles or proportion of articles in the New York Times that measure people from various disciplines. Economists are way high up, uh, followed by historians, and psychologists are a distant third. And then if you look at number of mentions in the congressional record, you see the same sort of thing. Economists just absolutely crush everybody else, followed by historians, and then some there, some there, somewhere down at the beginning of the rubble uh, is psychology. So I think it's interesting to juxtapose those two trends, those two developments, the, the points that Lee Jossum is bringing to our attention, and also this, this uh, conversation about who's actually having influence in the, the broader marketplace of ideas. And, and there's been debate about this in, in, response to the, in response to the New York Times article. There's been a, a room for debate section about whether economists are overrated. And Justin Wolfers, the, a major economist at the New York Times who wrote the original article, says, my two cents about whether economists are overrated. Economists may be overrated, often wrong or flawed, but what matters is whether our advice is better than the alternative, it is. Meanwhile, on a somewhat random note, Nick Kristof, another columnist at the Times, writes, if only sociologists wrote for the general public the way scholars of history do, we'd have much more informed public debates. So on the one hand, we have a, a movement that suggests like we need to be careful about overclaiming in our science, particularly when we talk to the media or share our ideas with the media. Simultaneously, we're hearing, well, there's various disciplines that are dominating the debate. We're not among the disciplines that are particularly influential. And, um, 
And, you know, so, so again, I, th I find this to be an interesting juxtaposition. You can, of course, have infinite scientific integrity and communicate with the general public, and I want to play with what that looks like here in today's talk. So, with regard to all issues of scientific integrity other than fraud, fraud is always in its own category, but all issues of scientific integrity, we've been talking about a lot of these in the field lately, um, it's, I don't think, very useful to talk abstractly. It's easy to like hurl principles at each other, but I think it's really best to talk about these things concretely, to give concrete examples, and think through pros and cons. So let me talk about two distinct cases where we might share ideas with the media. The first case is where there is a major media emphasis on a topic already. So for example, you might think, that, like a, a senator might say, well, I think affirmative action should be based solely on socioeconomic status. There's no need for us anymore to account for race. Right? We as social and personality psychologists might have data that bear on whether race can account for unique variants and discrimination beyond class or something like that, and we might want to add our voice to a conversation that's already happening. I'm going to give you a concrete example closer to home, just because I don't want to point fingers at other people to be judged. I'll point fingers at myself. Feel free to judge. This is um, Neil Clark Warren. That, when I say myself, that's not me. That is, in fact, another person. Um, and he talks about his 29 dimensions of compatibility. You might have seen him dominating your television screen. And what he says is, after extensive research involving thousands of married couples, Dr. Warren confirmed that these dimensions were indeed highly predictive of relationship success and could be used to match singles. What's he talking about? Social personality psychology, relationship science, right? He's talking about us. So he is using our findings to match people. This is a major corporation doing this. And just in case you didn't get the message that this is the scientific dating site, you can go to their website and see the 29 dimensions portrayed in the same format as the uh, fundamental table of elements. Now, it just so happens that we, as scientists, the, the people who actually do the work that he's claiming to use for the betterment of the world, know a little bit about this. So this is a, a publication that, that Paul Eastwick, Ben Carney, Harry Reese and Sue Sprecher and I have in, in a journal called Psychological Science in the Public Interest, a journal whose very, what is it, raison d'etre, uh, the, the reason for existence is to share our findings with the public interest. We knew we commented a lot about whether the, the similarity metric that the, or the principle of similarity that eHarmony is using is in principle plausible as a useful way to match people. Uh, after this, Ben Carney and I wrote a, a New York Times op-ed piece about that and we said this, Perhaps as a result of, uh, anyway, these sites tend to emphasize similarity on psychological variables like personality and attitudes. The problem with this approach is that such forms of similarity between two partners generally don't predict su the success of their relationship. According to a 2008 meta-analysis of 313 studies, similarity on personality traits and attitudes had no effect on relationship well-being in established relationships. In addition, a 2010 study of more than 23,000 married couples showed that similarity on the major dimensions of personality counted for a mere 5% of how satisfied spouses were with their marriages, leaving the other 99.5% to other factors. Now, in, you know, if we want to critique this, we did a major no-no here. We concluded that there was evidence for the null hypothesis. We said they don't predict or had no effect. That is really not the way we should be talking. All of us know that. And yet, I think I would say that this case here is the easier type of case. There was a vast corpus of literature we were drawing on. We were adding our voice to a, a conversation that was already filling up with a whole lot of other people's voices. We had the actual relevant science. So you might or might not think what we did here is ethical. But let me give you one that I have done on my own that is perhaps even less ethical. So many of us not only want to add our voice to a chorus of voices that are already yammering away on a topic, but we find something new and fun and cool and exciting and we think it can make a difference in the world or will rile people up or get people excited and we want to share those findings with the media. So I want to talk, so for example, you can imagine when Carol Dweck was first beginning her research program on, on uh, implicit theories that she finds that actually telling children that they're smart undermines their performance in, in difficult domains. And she, let's just imagine, wanted to issue a press release on that. So that would be a reasonable case like this. I'll talk about, for obvious reasons, I'll talk about one of my own massive ethical failings. So we did this study, um, this was in collaboration with Erica Slaughter, Laura Lukies, Greg Walton, and James Gross, on a brief reappraisal to promote, uh, on how a brief reappraisal intervention to promote conflict, what? A brief intervention to promote conflict reappraisal 
uh, preserves marital quality. So what we did is we recruited 120 married couples from the Evanston and Chicago area, and every four months they wrote for they wrote briefly about the biggest conflict they'd had over the preceding four months, and then in the second year we randomly assigned half of them to a reappraisal intervention. So everybody's doing the same thing at all waves, but in the second year, the people assigned to the reappraisal condition not only wrote about the conflict, but also wrote a little bit more about the conflict from the perspective of a neutral third party who wants the best for all involved. So uh, this was a total of a 21-minute intervention over the course of the year. And what you can see here, um, for those of you who are married, you already know this. For those of you who aren't married, I'm sorry to tell you this. Um, in every study that's ever been done that I know of, every longitudinal study, Marital quality on average goes down over time, but what we found is in our condition that we sometimes call the marriage hack, we were able to eliminate that downward trend in marital satisfaction. And not just marital satisfaction, also marital passion and other types of variables like that, love and intimacy, et cetera. I, again, wrote a New York Times op-ed, and I want to get into detail on this to uh, invite your judgment. So I began with, uh, have you decided what to get your Valentine this year? You could try something classic like chocolates or something blingy like earrings or sexy like lingerie. But if you really want to improve your relationship, you should give your loved one an IOU. Find a nice piece of stationery, and in your most graceful lettering, assert, quote, I promise to write about our next three fights as though I were a neutral observer. Then doodle a heart on the page, stick it uh, in a pretty envelope, and give it to that special someone over dinner. And by the way, the artists that the New York Times recruits are amazing, right? That is like the most adorable representation of what I was trying to say. Now, here's what I said. New research suggests that this may be the most valuable present you'll ever give. It, oh, after all, conflict is, an inevitable, is inevitable in long-term relationships, and the way people navigate it can affect not only their happiness, but their mental and physical health as well. What? Did I say this? This might be the most valuable present you'll ever give? Like, I read this recently knowing I was going to show it to you guys, and I'm embarrassed. This is not the way we talk amongst ourselves. This is, it should have looked like this. New research suggests that this writing task may buffer spouses against normative declines in marital quality. Of course, this is the first study of its kind, and it's always risky to draw conclusions based on any one study, because replicating a study like this takes many years, so we won't know until at least 2020, if ever, whether the writing task actually helps marriages. In addition, the effect is modest in magnitude, so we really shouldn't overstate its importance. Even if the effect is robust, it's just one factor among dozens or hundreds that influence the quality of our marriages. Perhaps more importantly, it's too, too early to know whether our, uh, it would emerge at all in participant samples that differ from the one we used in this study. But those caveats aside, I want to suggest that there are two different nations, two different worlds almost, and, and one is called Worldistan, and it has certain conventions like bluntness, like loudness, like certitude, like emotionality, like concreteness, like Dr. Phil, right, or Rush Limbaugh, the people who really have a lot of currency in this world. And there is this other world called, called Science Land, where we value things like preliminary conclusions and focus on limitations and tentative language and modest claims and abstractness, right? But the problem is, and that's great, right? When we talk amongst ourselves, we should talk that way. That is the best way to think about scientific findings. The problem is that's world to stand over on the left, and if you can't see it, that's Science Land over on the right. Right? So they happen to have not only the loudest voices, control over all of the television stations, but truly, if we are interested in communicating with the public in a way that might make them want to fund our research, it's useful that policymakers, the general public, et cetera, know what we do and view us as useful contributors. To my mind, we are left with three options in terms of how we want to deal with talking to the media. The first one, don't talk to the media. Right? It is a very realistic thing. Many of you will decide you don't want to do it because you're unwilling to use the sort of prose that, that uh, it really plays well in that context. A second option, be willing to talk to the media, recognize the value of communicating our ideas, but do so in the language of science. Be very rigorous about upholding the highest level of scientific integrity in everything that you say. Tentative language, preliminary conclusions, modest effect sizes, you could do that stuff. Or you can talk to the media in the language of the marketplace. Now let me just suggest to you that one and two actually don't differ. Because if you try to talk to the media with the, like what I wrote as my alternative version of my op-ed, they will never talk to you again. And if you tried to get into a live debate with Dr. Phil that way, he would squash you like a bug. Right? So my take is if we decide, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm sort of offering my perspective on this, but let me just say that I don't think we thought seriously about these issues, the ethics of giving psychology away, and I'm open-minded to a broader debate. As of this point, my view is that the benefits of sacrificing some amount of our care, our, 
our rigor, our scientific integrity in terms of talking about the findings, sacrificing some minor amount of that or some modest amount of that in order to have our ideas added to the marketplace of ideas might be a good value. And when I conclude, I want to say that it, there's been a broad broad movement in the field over the last four or five years about scientific integrity and principles and values and what is it that we care about. And I want to suggest that with the exception always of fraud, every one of these things should be bandied about not as universals, not as finger pointing, not as like vigilantes looking for people who are violating these principles, but as guideposts, as recommendations, as ideal practices that then, con that then interact or confront broader truths, broader complexities, the, the trade-offs involved in making the science better and making the world a better place, and that when we think this way in terms of subtlety and trade-offs, we will have a better field and we will be able to add our voices to the community of ideas more successfully. Thank you.